Next, we're going to learn about what perhaps might be the most important probability distribution, and that is the normal distribution. This distribution is for continuous random variables. Here's what the mathematical function looks like of, of, of the normal distribution. f of y is equal to 1 over sigma times the square root of 2 pi, then e raised to the negative 1, I'm sorry, raised to the negative y minus mu squared over 2 sigma squared power. Okay, so let's talk about a few things about this mathematical equation. First of all, it's defined for a y value anywhere from negative infinity to positive infinity, so wide range. Um, also, this e here, just so that you remember, uh, in an algebra class, you'll learn that to be approximately 2.71. And also notice we have a mu and a sigma in there, and they are what you expect. They are parameters of interest. Mu is the expected value of y, and sigma squared is the variance of y, so sigma itself is the square root, positive square root, of, um, of the variance of y. And what mu and sigma do here is that they actually control the shape of the distribution itself. Um, and you'll see shortly how that is done. So here's a very general um, plot of this distribution. So you could plug in various values of y into the equation, get values of f of y out, you plot the y values on the x-axis, the f of y values on the y-axis, and then you join any any points that you plot with a with a with a with a line or curve. Um, and so this is what it looks like in general. The probability distribution is always centered at the mean. And the probability distribution is centered around the mean value, the population mean value. When y is equal to mu, then look what happens to our expression here. When y is mu, we get a zero up here. And so e to the 0 is equal to 1, and you're left with just 1 over sigma times the square root of 2 pi. And so this will always actually be the highest point relative to the y-axis of a plot. Now, the, the uh, what are called, again, the tails of the probability distribution as they flare out, um, how much they flare out is controlled by sigma. Again, sigma is a standard deviation, and remember how it represents the amount of variability that there exists for a particular variable of interest. And so the higher the sigma value, the more that this distribution will be spread out. The lower the sigma, the more tight the distribution will be. Okay, let's see here. So since we're symmetric about mu, that means the probability y is greater than mu or the probability y is less than mu, both are equal to 0.5. Since this is a probability distribution for a continuous random variable, the probability underneath the curve and above um, f of y is equal to 0 is equal to 1. Let's see here. Okay, so let's talk about actually plotting the distribution itself. So we're going to come back to this curve function again, and R has a has already a pre-programmed function available to you that actually is f of y. So this function is d norm. So let's just uh, give an example of how to use it. So d stands for de uh, uh, density, norm stands for normal, and if we were to what, what is the height of the curve at 24.3, which is equal to, of course, the mean, with a standard deviation of 0.6, what we will get back is 0.6649. Now, if you remember what I told you before, is the height of, um, or when uh, y is equal to uh, mu, uh, we get 1 over sigma times the square root of 2 times pi, pi 3.1415, we get the same thing. And so that shows you how this actual function works. 
Uh, so this X argument corresponds to what we think of as Y. Um, of course, mean is, is uh, uh, corresponds to mu. SD corresponds to sigma, sigma. Sorry, I didn't say that before. Okay. So with the curve function itself, we can have R actually plot then the probability distribution for the expression or EXP R argument. We put in D norm, and we want to plot it as a, a function of what's on the x-axis. So we always have to use um, the value x there, even though we're dealing with a y. Put the mean in, put the standard deviation in. And unfortunately, I have from 20 to 30 there, actually, that, well, that will work. I like to use x lim uh, combined 20, 30. Let me actually do that also for these other ones here real quick. There we go. And we're going to color this probability distribution with dark green. The line width will be two times the default. Y-axis label, X-axis label. Let's go ahead and plot that normal distribution. And open up in a different monitor. Let me pull it over here. And this is what the actual probability distribution looks like. Again, it's centered at approximately 20, it is centered at 24.3. We can see it's um, symmetric. It's kind of a mound shape. If you've ever heard of the term bell curve before, the normal distribution essentially is that bell curve. But now let's look at what it would happen if we change one, um, one of the parameters, mu or sigma. Suppose we change the standard deviation to 1.3. So again, you should think about, without even plotting it, what would that plot look like? Well, as I told you before, when there's a higher standard deviation, that means there's more variability. So the tails of the distribution will be spread out more. Let's see if that happens. So I'm going to use the curve function again to do it. Um, but I'm going to add it to the current plot that we're on. So I say add equal true. And here's our plot. The blue is the new probability distribution that I just plotted. And we can see how the tails are more spread out uh, be as before. There's still an area of one underneath the curve. So we still have that. So essentially what's being done is, is that as that standard deviation goes up, we essentially take our hand to the top of the green curve and just kind of press down on it, and that causes the tails to spread out. Well, let's also make another comparison to what we originally had. So we're going to uh, go back to using a standard deviation of 0.6 again. But what if we change the mean to be 23.1? Let's go ahead and do that. Oops. Let me try it again. And notice the red, which is the new distribution I just plotted, is exactly the same as what we originally had with the green distribution. So for now, everything is shifted and center now at 23.1, the, uh, the new mean that we were left with. Notice how the shape of the distribution is exactly the same uh, because we have the same standard deviation. Okay, let's go back to the notes here. We are on page, uh, about on page four. Now, some books will actually state a normal distribution in a symbolic manner like this. Where they might say, let's say we have a normal random variable y. It is distributed, I'm sorry, let me say that again. Suppose we have a random variable y. It is distributed as a normal random variable with a mean mu and a variance of sigma squared. This tilde here is read as distributed as the n is corresponds to normal distribution. This is just common notation that you see many people use. Again, the reason why I'm introducing you to more notation is because you know, many people have different ways to denote exactly the same thing. That can be confusing. Um, and you need to get used to the different ways to denote this stuff. Um, and, and the sooner that you do, the more success that you'll have. Now, there is a very important special case of a normal distribution that people often use. And this is what's called the standard normal distribution. 
And in that case, it's just simply the normal distribution with a mean of mu, I'm sorry, uh, with uh, a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. And so in that particular case, uh, this is how uh, our expression for the normal distribution simplifies. Now, very often as well, whenever one deals with a, a standard normal distribution, people often now write it in terms of a letter Z rather than Y. Uh, you'll get kind of an idea why people do that later on in our notes. So let's have some fun finding probabilities with a normal distribution so we can get used to working with it. Let's say that we're interested in a car miles per gallon once again. Uh, mean of 24.3, standard deviation of 0.6 for a particular kind of car. Okay, let's find the probability that a randomly selected car gets less than 23 miles per gallon if it can be characterized, if a kind of car can be characterized by this normal uh, kind of distribution. So whenever you have a problem like this, and there will be many problems like this, it's always good to draw a plot. You know, we can again go back to the curve function uh, again. And here is 23. And so we want to find the probability that y is less than 23. And so we can see that that's a really small area underneath that curve. So a way to kind of check our answer is if we're going to answer that small. Well, that's a good sign that we got it right. If we got an answer that was large, that's a very good sign that we got it wrong. So how do I find this area underneath the curve? Well, this is where we can use integration again. So I can integrate from negative infinity to 23. You might be saying, wait a second, how can you have a negative miles per gallon? Well, you can't. Uh, but this distribution is defined from negative infinity to positive infinity. Now, what I want you to think about on your own is, well, what will be then the probability that y is less than zero in this particular setting? Uh, and then you can relate that to, is it a really a big deal that I wrote this integral uh, from negative infinity to 23? Again, just as a reminder, I won't ask you a question about uh, to do any kind of integration on a test or a project. The reason why I'm introducing it in terms of integration here is because many, many, many of you have had a course on calculus. Okay, so we plug in the standard deviation. We plug in the mean. We could do the integration. Instead, what we will do in this class, though, is we will use a nice function that's already in R called P-norm. P stands for probability. Norm stands for normal distribution. So with P norm, we are actually going to give a quantile, a quantile value of 23, because we want to know what's the probability that you're to the left of 23. We specify the mean, we specify the standard deviation, and we get 0 0.015. And indeed, this area right here as what we saw from a visual depiction of it, is very small. And so 0 0.015 does make sense relative to this particular problem. Okay. Let's actually jump on over here to R. Now, how did I actually f do that particular plot? Well, again, we could draw the normal distribution. We're going to put a line on the y-axis at 0. Let's just verify that I did it right. Yep. Now, I need to draw a line at 23 so that we can symbolically see I want to find the probability of being less than 23. And here's how you can do it. I can use the segments function, where basically what I'm going to do is give R a pair of points Oops. to draw a straight line between. So my first set of points is going to be called, let's say, x0, y0. And to draw this line where I want to, I'm going to start on the x-axis at 23 and also on the y-axis at 0. Next, the next pair of points I'm going to draw it is going to be 
x-axis 23. Now my y-axis, I want to go up to the top of that curve when x is equal to 23. So I use the denorm function again. We're going to say color red, and we're going to let the line width be 5 times the default. So if we run that code, that's how I was able to draw the plot. Okay. Now, so that we get a better understanding of what happens when we change mu, what happens when we change sigma, let's look at some other cases of finding the probability y is less than 23. Let's suppose we look at the situation where the standard deviation now is back up to 1.3. Remember what happens? The tails kind of fan out pretty, uh, more to represent. Now we have more variability. And so what you should ask yourself without even looking at the plot, well, what's going to happen to that probability that I just had? Well, it should increase because now I have, I'm going out further. I, y can be a, more, uh, um, a larger variety of values. So in this particular case, P norm, my quantile is 23 again, mean 24.3, standard deviation is 1.3, and we can see on this two-scale plot that indeed that is a larger area, and it's equal to 0.1586. Okay, now we're on page 8. Well, let's say that sigma is 0.6 again, but now mu is 23.1. What do you expect to have happen to the probability of y less than 23? Once again, you need to come up with an intuitive understanding of what will happen here. Now I'm closer to the mean than I was before. So because of that, the probability should go up. And here's a two-scale drawing of what happens. And indeed, that area is a lot larger. That area ends up being equal to 0.43. And here's a nice little comparative plot of the three different uh, situations so you can see what's actually happening. Well, let's make things a little bit more fun. Let's work with sigma 0.6, mu equal 24.3 again. What's the probability that y is now within an interval of 23 and 25? Okay, let's look at that on a plot first. So here is 23, here is 25. I want to find this area right here. Okay. Now, the way that R's p norm function works is it always finds the area to the left of the quantile of interest. So what we could do is this. How about, first of all, we find the area from underneath this curve, from 25 all the way down to negative infinity. So all that area there. Then what we're going to do since we've done now too much, we only want the area between 23 and 25. How about we just subtract off then that area from 23 down to negative infinity? And that's how you find these kinds of probabilities. So the probability that y is less, uh, I'm sorry, the y is between 23 and 25 is equal to the probability that y is less than 25 minus the probability y is less than 23. So now I have two separate applications of the p-norm function here, and I get a probability of 0.86. Does that large of a probability make sense relative to this diagram? Oh yeah, it sure does. Okay. Now let's suppose again, sigma is 0.6, mu is equal to 24.3. Well, what's the probability y is greater than 23? This is where the complement comes into play that we've seen earlier. So remember the probability that A, uh, probability of A is equal to 1 minus the probability of A complement using the complement rule where A is some kind of event of interest. Now A, let's say, is this Y is greater than 23. So if I find then 1 minus the probability of Y now being the opposite, less than or equal to 23, 
That's how I find this particular problem. We've already found 1 minus the probability y is less than 23. It is, let me go back real quick. Point zero one five. So this is approximately point nine eight five. Again, look at a plot, see if that makes sense. Now you might be wondering, well, why did I put a that does it matter if I find, let's say, the probability of y less than or equal to twenty-three versus the probability of y is less than twenty-three? Well, these happen to be equal. And it all comes down to something that we talked about previously with respect to continuous probability distributions. And that is the probability y would be equal to a particular value is always equal to zero if you have a continuous random variable. Okay. Well, let's suppose now that sigma is 0.6, mu is equal to 24.3 again. Well, what's the probability that y is less than 23 or y is greater than 25? This is going to be another application of the complement. I would like you to try that on your own. After you try it, you can take a look at what I have underneath that black highlighted area for some help on what the right answer is. Okay, so that takes us to page 11. Now we're going to turn things around a little bit here. So instead of us finding a probability corresponding to a given quantile, how about we try to find a particular quantile given a particular probability? For example, what miles per gallon is at least required for a car to be in the top 5% of all these same types of cars? Sigma is 0.6, mu is equal to 24.3. So what that means is this, in order to be in the top 5%, y is going to have to be greater than some particular miles per gallon. Let's call it Q. And we want to know, well, where does that occur such that that probability is greater than point, I'm sorry, such that that probability is equal to 0 0.05. So again, in terms of calculus in terms of doing integration, what we're trying to do is this. Set 0 0.05 equal to the integral from q to infinity of this normal distribution. Or equivalently, we can think again in terms of the complement. 1 minus the probability y is less than q would be 0.95. And so that's how I've written this integral here. Well, so in other words, we need to find, we need to work with this probability. And the way that we do that is that now since we're looking for the quantile, rather than using the p-norm function, we use the q-norm function. Okay. So here's how it works. So we say q-norm. We have our probability is 0.95. We again put in the mean. We again put in the standard deviation. And the answer is... 25.29. Again, let's look at a plot to see if this makes sense. So I go ahead and plot 25.29 on it. And remember, the probability being greater than this is 5% or 0 0.05. Yeah, based upon what I see in this plot, that does definitely make sense. Okay, let's take a look at another example. This deals with grading. Now, I don't think this is done very much anymore, but um, I wouldn't be surprised if there are some places where it is. And this is um, corresponds to a situation where, let's say, a professor says, I'm going to grade on the bell curve, meaning I'm going to fix the grades corresponding to maybe, let's say, a test such that only the top 10% of all students will get an A. Uh, the next uh, top, the next 10% of the students will get Bs and so on irrespective of what the actual score was. So, for example, you might have, let's say, um, half the class get greater than a 90%, typically that we thought of as an A, but this professor says only the top 10% will get an A. So maybe instead of the cutoff line being at 90%, maybe it might be at 97% instead. Okay, 
So let's look at how that would work relative to a normal distribution. Suppose the set of test number one grades in a class is a normal distribution with a mu of 73, sigma of 8%. Oftentimes a professor might say, that's what I want uh, to occur. Let Y be a student's grade. Answer the following questions. What is the probability that a randomly chosen student in the class received a grade of 90% or better? So in other words, we need to find the probability Y is greater than 90 if this actually did truly hold. Okay, so let's actually plot the distribution. That's what I did. I plot, plotted a line for, at 90. Let's actually take a look at the plot. Here's the plot here. So we can see there's not a large percentage that would be greater than 90. And how do we find this? Well, the probability Y is greater than 90. I'm going to need to use the complement due to how the p-norm function works. So I'm going to work with 1 minus the probability Y is less than 90 so that this part can be found with the p-norm function. And I get 0.016. What percentage of students score between a 70% and a 90%? So we want to find again, what's the probability being between 70 and 90? We break it up into two different components so that again, we can take into account how the p-norm function works, where it finds area underneath, the, area underneath the curve to the left. So we can break this up as the probability y is less than 90 minus the probability y is less than 70 use two applications of the p-norm function, and we get 0.63. What does this look like graphically? Here we go. And again, that area underneath the curve, you know, it looks like about 0.63. Okay, now let's take a look at this. We have a choice. Suppose an instructor curves the test number one grades and that only the top 10% of scores will receive A's. Would a student be better off with a test number one grade of 81%? Still with our mean of 73, sigma of 8% uh, characterizing the distribution. Or a grade of 68% only. Where for that particular test, we're going to set mu to be 62% and sigma to be equal to 3%. Okay, so... This is another example of basically working the opposite way, where now we, we have a probability, 10%, and now we want to find the corresponding uh, quantile for that. Let's actually graph the two situations here. Here are the two curves. So the green one was the original probability distribution, the blue one uh, was the now the new probability distribution. And so we want to find the, uh, uh, a quantiles or quantile such that 10% uh, of the grades are higher, 90% are lower. And again, because of how R does these calculations with QNorm, we need that lower probability. So we put 0.9 there. Uh, here's with the first case, the people with an 83.25% or higher will get A's in that class. With the second case, though, people with a 65.85% will get an A. And we had, remember, two different choices here. Would you prefer a grade of 68% on the second test or 81% on the first test? Well, only the 68 would receive an A, so you would prefer that. 68 is greater than 65.8. Okay, so that takes us to now the top of page 17. We've talked a few times already about the rule of thumb for the number of standard deviations all data lies from its mean. How does this work now relative to the normal probability distribution? Okay, well this is actually essentially how the empirical rule comes about. So if you remember, this, what I call the rule of thumb, actually comes about through two other more formal rules, Chebyshev's theorem and the empirical rule. 
this is where the empirical rule comes from. Where if you have this a normal shaped distribution here, you can find the probability that y is between uh, mu minus 2 times sigma and mu plus 2 times sigma, and you will get approximately 0.95. You could also work with three standard deviations as well. Now what I want you to do on your own is I want you to see that no matter what you choose for mu and sigma, you will always get this 95%. Um, and that's then essentially where this empirical rule comes from. Okay, so we have a question here. Suppose y has a normal distribution. What's the probability y is equal to the mean itself? After all, that's the average value that you would expect for y. I want you to answer that on your own. We've kind of already talked about that earlier in this uh, set of notes. Okay. Let's next talk about the standard normal probability distribution. As I mentioned at the beginning, this is a special case of the normal distribution where the mean or mu is equal to zero and the standard deviation or sigma is equal to one. Why is this particular case of mu and sigma often uh, used relative to the normal distribution? And the reason is because there have been tables created that uh, represent what probabilities are for this particular normal distribution. So for example, this is what one of these tables or part of one of these tables would look like. And let's say I have z as a standard normal random variable. And I want to find the probability that z is less than negative 3.41. What one would do in this table is you look down the rows where you see the first two significant digits, 3.4. Then you look at the columns where you see that third significant digit, 1. And so when you match them up, that row and column, you get then that corresponding probability. You could do another example, let's say for negative 2.57. Here's negative 2.5. Here's 0 0.07. If you match them all up, you get a probability of 0 0.0051. So it provides a convenient way to find probabilities with this particular standard normal distribution. Do note that we will not use these kinds of tables in this class at all. There's no reason to use them because we have, for example, R or other computing software packages that will automatically find these probabilities for us. I point this table out because unfortunately there are still people who go to these kinds of tables to find those kinds of probabilities. Um, now, why just this one normal distribution? Here's the reason why, top of page 19. Let's say I have y that has a mean mu standard deviation sigma, random variable. If I subtract off mu, now this part right here now actually will have a mean of zero. And if I divide by sigma, rather than now having a, a variance, I'm sorry, a standard deviation of sigma, now this whole thing here has a standard deviation of one. So the reason why we have these kinds of tables, and it's only for the standard normal distribution, is because we can easily transform any normal random variable to a standard normal random variable, take those probabilities from the standard normal table, and then equate them back to the case of working with y. Again, we won't really do that in this class, but I do want to give you one example prepare you in case you see this someplace else. Okay, so we can go back to what we originally were doing, finding the probability that a randomly selected car gets less than 23 miles per gallon. So we want the probability y is less than 23. So let's do some algebra. So I'm going to subtract mu from both sides of this original equation. And then I'm going to divide by sigma 
both sides of the equation. What I've done here though is on the right side I, I put in the numerical value for mu, I put in the numerical value for sigma. Here I did not so that you can see how this corresponds to z. So the probability y is less than 23 is equivalent to finding the probability that z, a standard normal random variable, is less than negative 2.17. If you really wanted to, you could go to a table to find that out. It's 0 0.015, or just simply use the p-norm function, where you would say, oops, q equal to negative 2.17, mean equals 0, standard deviation equal 1. Okay. How about page 20 now? So we've been calculating a lot of probabilities. Of course, these probabilities are only valid if a normal distribution truly quantifies how, in our car case, how miles per gallon are distributed in a particular population. If this normal distribution is not correct, then uh, essentially these probabilities are worthless. Let's look at an example. Here's a plot, excuse me, page 21. Here's our original normal distribution that we had for the car miles per gallon example. And let's say that there is a different probability distribution that actually does work for this particular situation. Um, uh, without going into all the details, this is actually referred to as a uniform probability distribution. Uh, we won't look at that in, in, a, in any detail though. But here is, 23 drawn by the black line there and we can see again underneath the green curve that corresponding probability of being uh, having y less than 23 is very small but now if the true distribution was what's denoted here in pink wow that probability is a lot larger and in fact with this particular probability distribution since essentially it kind of looks like a rectangle one can use base times height to find then that corresponding probability, <coughs> excuse me, and it ends up being 0.175, which is quite different from what we had with the normal distribution. Okay, so what do we do? How do we ever know that the normal probability distribution assumption is valid? Well, rarely, if ever, will the normal distribution be 100% correct. Then why are we looking at it? Well, very often it can be correct. So what you could do is you take a sample from a population. You could, let's say, plot a histogram. And similar to what we've seen in another situation, <coughs> we look to see, does it look mound shaped? Does it look kind of symmetric like a normal distribution? If it does, then that tells you, ah, yeah, I think that normal distribution is gonna be a good approximation to what's truly happening in the population. Also, you can work with the sample mean, you can work with the sample variance with respect to um, what then the population values could be. Now there's a number, another reason why we really like the normal distribution of statistics. And that is many statistics, like Y bar, the sample mean, will have a normal distribution. Now again, the statistic y bar is going to vary from one sample to the next. And if you did a plot of all the y bars, if you repeatedly took samples, what you will see is indeed that histogram looks like a normal distribution. And we will take advantage of that then when we make inferences from the sample to the population, not just for the for y bar, but for a number of other statistics as well, where this kind of result holds true. Okay, let me make sure that I've talked about everything that I wanted to. Yeah, I think I have then. So then that concludes this section on the normal probability distribution.